Hi, everyone, and welcome to The Sugar-Free Show with myself, Karen Thompson, and nutritionist, Emily McGuire. Today, we have one of my absolute favorite people, Gary Tiles, with us. Um, and if you don't know, he's an award-winning science and health journalist, best-selling author of Good Calories, Bad Calories, and Why We Get Fat. His latest book, The Case Against Sugar, is a groundbreaking, eye-opening expose that makes the convincing in case that sugar is the tobacco of the new millennium, backed by powerful lobbies entrenched in our lives and making us very sick. Welcome, Gary. We're so excited to have you. Well, thank you, guys. It's great to be talking to you countries. Fabulous. <laughs> so can we start off by just um, getting some of the thinking behind where the book came from and what it's all about? Okay, well, it's pretty simple. You know, my earlier books, I had... Um, I made this argument that refined grains and sugars are the sort of fundamental problems in modern diets and they work through a variety of mechanisms and every time I lectured about this or got criticized people would say well what about Southeast Asia here's a nation where they do consume a lot of refined grains and at least until recently they didn't have obesity or diabetes. It's certainly not anything close to the level that we have in the West. So this was clearly a good point and not one I hadn't considered, but I thought I would examine it further. And the deeper you dig, the more the sort of fundamental role of sugar, uh, and by sugar I mean like sucrose, the white stuff we put in our coffee and high fructose corn syrup, and the role that that plays in, in obesity, diabetes, and particularly this condition called insulin resistance, which underlies both of them. So I thought it was time that somebody wrote a book about that, and I was lucky enough to get funding from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation to do that, and the case against sugar is the result. And I pretty much, there's been so much misunderstanding and so much confusion and so much sort of unscientific thinking that I wanted to, you know, even though I'm a journalist, I wanted to take the opportunity to try and set the record straight what the basis of the arguments should be. So, as I say I in the I'll just finish one second. As I say in the book, this is like the, if this were a criminal case and you wanted to understand why we have these epidemics of obesity and diabetes all over the world, this is the case for the prosecution and why we should be blaming, or at least sugar should be our prime suspect. Yeah, I absolutely um, love that part in the book and I like the premise of it for um, the title of the case against sugar. Um, but just to back up, just to kind of set the scene for it all. So you were saying that you were, you know, criticized with regards to the, the difference in carbohydrate, etc. So when we're talking about sugar, what are you actually talking about? What, what is sugar? <laughs> and this is, this is a really good point. I mean, it's funny, I've already gotten criticized for writing a book that's not as simple and narrative as some people would like. And one of the reasons why is because you have to keep on backing up to clarify things. So as far back as say 15 years ago, you could find people who didn't really, like experts, epidemiologists and public health authorities who literally didn't know what they were talking about when they were talking about sugar. And so when, we're to, when I'm talking about sugar, you know, it gets so confusing because we have blood sugar, which is glucose, and the sugar in most, all carbohydrates are to some extent, you know, sugars. Um, when we're talking about sugar, we mean sugars that are roughly half glucose and half fructose. And fructose is a simple sugar and it's the sweetest of the sugar, so it's what makes sugar sweet and it's what makes fruits sweet. There's a little bit of uh, fructose and sucrose, which is glucose and fructose in all sweets, I mean all fruits, and that's why they taste sweet to us. So that's what we're talking about. And the two primary sugars in modern diets today are sucrose. That's when we talk about beet sugar and cane sugar, and that, you know, dates back a few thousand years. It's been refined. And then the Beginning in the mid to late 1970s, we started putting what's called high fructose corn syrup into our food supply, and it kind of took over the beverage industry by the mid 80s. And that's again roughly 50% fructose, 50% glucose. 
And what makes these unique is that we metabolize the fructose primarily in our liver. So nutritionists like to say a calorie is a calorie. Obesity researchers like to say a calorie is a calorie. That's like a mantra, and it means it doesn't matter where you get your calories. You have to eat too much of any of them to get fat, and a calorie of broccoli is you know, no better nor worse than a calorie of sugar or a calorie of kumquats. And the truth is these sugars all get metabolized differently. And it's a bit inane to think that a calorie should be a calorie because our body does something, responds differently to all these different sugars. And fructose, because we consume so much, but again, seems to be a prime suspect here. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, your your book, and, and the same with Good Calories, Bad Calories, takes us through the amazing kind of history of where we kind of were, were to where we are now. So can you, in kind of a brief synopsis, I don't know if this is going to be too possible, but can it take us through where the history of sugar has come from up to kind of how accepted it is in today's society? Okay, so yeah, it's funny, I have a chapter in the new book that I think is the, the first 10,000 years of brief history. <laughs> and so sugar comes out of Indonesia like 6,000 years ago, and it, it, it slowly makes its way to India and China, where we start, the farmers start refining sort of cane sugar, or sugar cane, the plant, into refined sugar. That's about 2,000 to 2,500 years ago in India, and it slowly makes its way east to the Mediterranean. Um, by a thousand years ago, there are viable sugar industries all around the Mediterranean, and then with the New World, um, actually Columbus takes stops on his way to the New World to pick up sugar refiners and sugar cane and so he could plant it in the New World and the first sugar cane industry and starts in Brazil when Columbus's pilot goes to Brazil and launches and starts planting sugar cane they refine sugar um, and from there just slowly and then faster and faster and faster begins to take over the world in modern diets. And it does so, it's like there are a lot of what are called drug foods or drugs that came out of the new world and kind of took over commerce in the 17th, 18th century. So did coffee, chocolate, uh, sugar, alcohol, rum, which comes from sugar and by the mid, with the Industrial Revolution in the 19th century, um, and it gets very cheap to refine sugar, and then the Europeans finally master getting sugar from beets, from sugar beets, and suddenly it's like it just explodes. And from the 1850s onward, it just saturates our diets in every possible way. And you see the invention of the, the candy industry and the chocolate industry and the ice cream industry and the soft drink industry, and then, um, the, the funny sugary cereals come around about 50 years later because the cereal industry had its um, its origins in the health food movement. So they had nutritionists who thought sugar was evil and they kind of delayed the inevitable for 50 years and then uh, post cereals released the first sugar-coated cereal and suddenly everyone else had to get into the business or compete. Um, so by 1960s, it's like there's this complete transformation of diet where dessert has become sort of this thinly veiled low fat. I mean, breakfast is now like kind of a variation on dessert, you know, mm -hmm. lower fat, but mm -hmm. just massive doses of sugar. And mm -hmm. all of these industries are targeting children and women, basically like men had alcohol and cigarettes and kids mm -hmm. and women had sugar. And, you know, often when we do studies on this stuff, it's fascinating. You, know, you do the studies in adults, right? I mean, it's like, college kids or adults, but what we did is we started feeding, again, women sugar so that when they got pregnant, whatever the effects of metabolizing this massive amounts of sugar is, it would be trans, um, might be, you know, uh, transferred to the children while they're pregnant, and then we're suddenly kids are eating sugar in a way that this species never saw before. And, you know, lo and behold, like 20, 30 years later, you've got these massive epidemics of obesity and diabetes. And the question is, why are we blaming anything other than sugar at the moment? Yeah. And, of course, I... 
Sorry, Gary. Keep going. <laughs> no, I can talk forever. You go. <laughs> um, I was just going to say, why do you think there was such a free pass on sugar given? Why is it been allowed to get to where it is? Well, part of it was this sort of, um, I mean, a, a large part of it was when people really started implicating sugar and disease. Well, they, we had a lot of misconceptions. You know, you know, all my work is kind of a critique of the nutrition science of the past 150 years. So the first misconception, the first disease people really link to sugar in some kind of concerted way is diabetes. And this starts 100 years ago when diabetes rates start climbing. Like Mid-19th century, you can barely find a diabetic in hospitals, even though this is a horrible disease without insulin. As diabetes rates start climbing, people say, hey, it's climbing in coincidence with sugar consumption. It's clearly a carbohydrate intolerance problem. We should blame sugar. And the problem is most diabetics, type 2 diabetes is associated with obesity. And so the diabetes researchers in the 1920s said, well, it's associated with obesity. We believe obesity causes it. Viable hypothesis, therefore we're going to blame it all on gluttony and sloth. And they just sort of argued louder <clears throat> and there were more, I don't know why, I mean, for whatever reason that argument caught on and the idea that sugar was to, to blame faded away. The 1960s researchers started identifying all the ways sugar could cause diabetes. But now we have this theory that fat causes heart disease, which it comes out of the 1950s and is being pushed by these very zealous proponents of their, their, you know, a lot of scientists have this problem that they have a good hypothesis and then they convince themselves that God basically told them that this is true. And it's got to be true and it doesn't matter that we haven't done the tests yet. So this dietary fat hypothesis, the problem is, Heart disease is also associated with obesity and it's associated with diabetes. So you can't blame obesity and diabetes maybe on sugar and carbs and blame heart disease on fat. That's not a very parsimonious notion. So you end up blaming everything on fat because those researchers were more politically corrected and it was a more sort of politically acceptable hypothesis. So by the 1970s, the sugar hypothesis is being pushed by these British nutritionists and they just kind of get voted down. And then in the process, the sugar industry comes along and says these people are attacking us. And the really good nutritionists think the problem is fat, not sugar. So we're going to agree with them. And it's true, most of the nutritionists thought the problem was fat. So they throw their influence and their money into kind of hiring these really good, quote, really good nutritionists, and they combine sort of kill the sugar theory. And yeah, the sugar theory was, in my impression, far more likely to be right. But we've been living with the consequences ever since. And what, when you're, because obviously with, again, the case against sugar, I mean, what kind of data was around then? Was there even anything to back up either a the size of the claims? Well, you had all, I mean, you had epidemiology. So you had this observation that whenever you added something in the Western, whenever populations throughout the world became um, Westernized, so they start trading with the West and they start eating Western diets, they start getting obese and diabetic. So again, it's interesting because the British researchers, you know, the British Empire had missionary and colonial physicians all around the world. So they would come all around the world. They were saying, we see the same thing. doesn't matter what the population were administering to, whether they're sort of pastoral populations in Kenya or, you know, in the Inuit populations in Northern Canada or South Pacific Islanders or Asians, wherever you start eating Western diets, you start getting these diseases. So they thought sugar, white flour, because that's what was common to Western diets when they spread all around the world. In the U.S., you had people looking at Americans, right? And they said, well, Americans eat high-fat diets, therefore we're going to worry about fat. Um, so you had that kind of observational evidence. And then you had these laboratory studies that were done on animals and college students where you give them, you know, high-fat diets and look at their cholesterol, or you give them high carb diets and look at their cholesterol and look at their 
triglycerides and their blood sugar. And clearly when you gave animals and humans high sugar diets, you saw in a significant number of them, not all of them, their lipids went crazy, okay, for lack of a technical term. But if you thought fat was a problem, you would say, well, hey, you know, look, it doesn't happen to everyone. So the evidence is ambivalent and we're going to ignore it. And if you thought sugar was a problem, you said, well, it's going to happen to some people. So that was kind of the level of evidence. And it depended, you know, what your bias was, how you interpreted it. And like I said, the people who thought fat was the problem just won the kind of consensus game in the 1970s. And then it wasn't until the 1990s that research kind of kicked up again because it was clear that if you give sugar to animals and humans, you can cause what's called metabolic syndrome or insulin resistance, which is you know, today considered sort of the primary risk factor for obesity, diabetes, heart disease. But back then, we thought, oh, it's just LDL cholesterol. It's a very long, complicated story. And if you don't know all the pieces, if you can't keep all the pieces in your head, it's hard to understand how we got here. And even I forget some of the pieces, despite having written three books about it. <laughs> I mean, one of the big things that, that's you know, constantly in the media and everything is the, the concept of sugar actually being addictive. Um, what are your thoughts on that? <laughs> well, the, um, I mean, if you have children, I don't think you need a lot of science to tell you whether it's addictive. That's a very unscientific, unjournalistic response. Let's just put it this way. The first chapter of my book is called Food or Drug, Drug or Food, I forget which. Um, and I wanted to put it in the first chapter because even before I get into the history about how sugar is traveling around the world, I want people to be asking themselves, is this, you know, is this what a drug is doing or what a food is doing? So I want to first discuss this possibility that food is addictive. And I write about 4,000 words. I finally have been struggling to write the book for years. I finally get a 4,000-word chapter written. And it talks about the evidence. And there's not a lot that it's addictive because nobody bothered to study this. You know, you think over the years, surely people would have studied this. But sugar was out of fashion. If you accused, if you thought sugar was bad for you, you were considered a quack. So with the exception of like one research group at Princeton and a French research group and maybe a couple others, nobody was looking into this. And the French, for instance, they, they've done these studies where they first you addict, you can't do these in kids, right? Because it's not exactly ethical. But first you addict rats or mice to cocaine or heroin. And then they could, you let them self-administer it. So every day they can give themselves what's called a bolus of heroin or cocaine. And then you suddenly you give them the opportunity to take sugar instead. And they have a few days where they can get a choice and eventually they have to choose one or the other. And all these animals will choose sugar over cocaine. In like two days, they're locked into sugar. They don't care about coke anymore. Um, heroin takes a little long. So you can at least say, look, it's pretty clear that this stuff's addictive to rats and mice. We still don't know if that applies to humans. And then there's all this other evidence that, you know, alcoholics for, you know, centuries have used sugar to wean themselves off alcohol. The big book, the 12-step program of Alcoholics Anonymous even recommends using sugar for this purpose. So I write this chapter discussing all of this. And then I have a friend named Charles Mann, who's a wonderful journalist and historian. Um, his nickname is Cam, and Cam has written a book called 1493, which is about how um, foods and plants spread around the world after Columbus. And Cam is a beautiful writer. I mean, he's such a beautiful writer that I don't like to read his books because they depress me. <laughs> But I realized that he has a large history of sugar, because sugar is one of these foods that spread around the world after Columbus. And I'm reading Cam's book, and in, he's got a parenthetical where he says in 17 words, uh, scientists debate amongst themselves whether sugar is an addictive substance or people just act like it is. And I think in 17 words, Cam has captured everything I was trying to say in 4,000, and if I was a really good journalist, I'd throw out that first chapter. <laughs> Instead, because it was the only progress I had made, I just quote Cam several different times. 
it almost doesn't matter what science finds. I mean, mm -hmm. people act like this stuff's addictive. I mean, the issue is it's everywhere. It so saturates our market that if you, our food supply, that it's virtually impossible to quit it without simply never eating packaged or processed foods. So most of us will go our, you know, can go years, we could swear we're gonna give up sugar, and then you never do because you're constantly eating foods in which sugar is an additive or high fructose corn syrup. Mm -hmm. But you know, clearly for many people, this they know it's bad for them, which is one of the sort of psychological definitions of, of addiction. So you know this activity is bad for you and they can't quit it. I get emails from people all the time saying basically, help me, what advice do you have? And I don't know what to say. You can just send them to us. Yes, yeah. next next time I will send them to you. <laughs> Thanks, Gary. Um, so, you know, the correlation with the tobacco industry and with tobacco, you, you do delve into that in the book. Um, and actually, I read some stuff there that I had never knew before. Um, what is your take on that? Um, it's a fascinating story. It's funny. There's a famous book on sugar that was written in the 70s by a guy named William Dufty. It's Gloria Vanderbilt's mm -hmm. husband called Sugar Blues. And he had mentioned this in his book that the tobacco industry basically increases the amount of sugar in the tobacco leaves to increase the addictive power of the leaves. And I had never been able to confirm that. I just couldn't do it. And I had tried over the years because it's a great story and I'm a journalist and I like great stories. Um, about uh, seven or eight years ago, I began working with this uh, woman named Kristen Kearns, who was a dentist who started investigating the sugar industry and found this cache of sugar industry documents in a, the archives of a defunct sugar, manifest, sugar refining company. And in those archives was this 1951 report by the Sugar Association about the link between sugar and tobacco. So post-World War II, the sugar industry was actually worried because everyone's saying sugar's fattening, and they thought people are clearly not going to keep eating their sugars. So we have to figure out a way to, we have to diversify our product. So any other way we can use sugar is good. And at the time, they didn't know that they, it was a bad idea to be proud of the fact that they were selling massive amounts of sugar to the tobacco industry. Um, but it turns out they were. And then you, once I found that document, you could find other places to confirm it. So it turns out the great um, technological revolution in the tobacco industry of the late 19th century was something called flu-curing tobacco. And what flu-curing does, aside from drying the leaves, is it maximizes, it increases the sugar content of the tobacco leaves. So tobacco that has about 3% sugar in it ends up after being flu cured with about 22% sugar in it. This is called Burley tobacco, Virginia tobacco. And this tobacco, the higher the sugar content, the easier it is to inhale the smoke. It's more acidic, so you could dry, um, draw it into your lungs without spurring this coughing mechanism. Um, the problem is with the high sugar content in the leaves, naturally you get a lower nicotine content. So you can draw it into your lungs, but you can't really, it's not as addictive because you don't have as much nicotine. So in 1913, with the uh, disassociation of something called the Tobacco Trust, R.J. Reynolds, which was a uh, company that mostly produced chewing tobacco, decides to make the first American blended cigarette, which is Camel. And what they do is they blend this Virginia, flu-cured Virginia tobacco with its high nicotine content with chewing tobacco, which is actually marinated in what's called a sugar sauce. So it's sugar and maple syrup and licorice. And that too has a high sugar content because you marinate it. And it's got a high nicotine content. So now you have a tobacco, I don't even know if they knew about this at the nicotine count, but now you have a tobacco that you could draw into your lungs, you can inhale easily, is very smooth, and has a high nicotine content. So not only is it very addictive, and sugar cigarette sales just shoot up and take off with Camel. And by the 1930s, every American cigarette manufacturer is producing these blended cigarettes, and they take over the world. But you've now got this vehicle for 
getting both the nicotine into your lungs, where it's highly addictive, and getting the carcinogens from the tobacco smoke into your lungs, where they could create lung cancer. So the lung cancer rates also start turning upward. It's, lung cancer is an excruciatingly rare disease until 1913. And then suddenly it starts showing up in the mortality records and it just you know skyrockets until we have this lung cancer epidemic all around the world that by the 1960s is finally linked to cigarettes. Without sugar, without the sugar in the leaves, you don't get the addictive cigarettes. I mean, people would still smoke. You're not gonna get kids hooked nearly as easily and you're not gonna get the lung cancer rates because you can't get carcinogens into your lungs. I mean, it's an amazing story, and it's funny, it didn't really fit in the book, okay, because that's, I'm talking about obesity, diabetes, and heart disease, but when I came upon this, I thought, how could I leave it out? And at one point, yeah, at one point I had the chapter was chapter two and a half, like that, I don't know if you guys ever saw the movie, uh, Making John Malcolm, Making John yeah. Malkovich. <gasps> yes. With, with uh, John Malkovich. Being for, John Malkovich. Yeah, being John Malkovich, yeah, so that, that's what I was thinking, it was, you know, the, the second, I could, I'm going to put it in the book, even if it doesn't really fit with the rest of the story I'm telling. <laughs> that really so, stood out for me. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. I, yeah, I mean, so where, where do you think that we are today, though? Do you think that, because there's now this terminology of, you know, sugar is the new tobacco, do you think it's kind of having its day, or do you still think we've got a long way to go with it? Um, I think people are really getting away. I think we're winning the sugar war. I mean, there's two issues, and some people who are kind of on our side in the basic dietary debate are not gonna like this book because they're gonna say I'm putting too much focus on sugar. When if you're obese or diabetic or predisposed, you wanna maybe get rid of all carbs <laughs> and or most carbs, easily digestible carbs, I agree with them. But I think we're winning the sugar war. I think the industry knows if they see the writing on the wall and they don't want to cause disease. This is, I mean, you know, people are always acting in a way that they can think the best of themselves. So most people, virtually all people. Um, so I think the industry sees the writing on the wall. I think they're going to delay the inevitable as late as they can, as far as they can, so they could diversify into other products. And you could see that clearly happening with PepsiCo and Coca-Cola. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of industries are trying to do the right thing. They want to know what's the maximum level of sugar they can put in their products without, you know, causing unnecessary harm. I don't know if there is such a level, but if, you know. So I think we're winning. I think it's going to take 20 years to, you know, slowly roll back. But I think with each year that goes by and all the efforts to, uh, in institute sugar taxes um, will help. There's clearly the health organizations are on board. The World Health Organization is definitely gets. I mean, they they still like to talk about sugar as empty calories, which is kind of naive. But um, but they they get what the problem is and they're going after it. So I think we're winning, um, and I think the industry knows they're losing and isn't going to fight that hard. I don't think it's going to be a situation like tobacco was, mm -hmm. um, despite some of the tactics and strategies until up till now being similar. But I may also be Pollyanna-ish. So. <laughs> so you touched upon a terminology there that I just wanted you to explain, because it's something I was taught in university, and that is empty calories. And that's something nutritionists and dietitians love as a concept and a terminology to say. So can you just say what it is and how it kind of, I suppose, takes away even the impact sugar can have on the body? Well, so this is the thing, and I'm kind of embarrassed that I didn't figure this out earlier in my life when I was writing my other books. Um, in science, and again, I tend to get long-winded, so I apologize. Um, all my books have been about how science is done. That's what fascinates me. And the thing that I didn't really think about is in science, the technology you have available determines the questions you can ask. 
And then the questions you can ask kind of determines the answers you get. And then you shape your hypotheses based on the information available, which is very technology dependent. So from the 1860s to 1920s, all of nutrition science is vitamins and mineral content in the foods. And so vitamin and mineral deficiencies, which are experiments you could do in animals and you could you know, measure these things. And then energy content of foods and the energy expended by living organisms, whether like experimental animals or humans. So in 1860s, uh, German uh, nutritionists create something called you know, room-sized calorimeters, which are these room-sized devices that measure how much energy people expend. And by doing so, they can now measure energy in and energy out. So by 1920, you have all of nutrition is about vitamins and minerals and calories, which is a measure of energy. And we come up with these theories. And so when we talk about sugar as empty calories, you're using, you're empty of vitamins and minerals and fiber and calories, which is the energy content. So you're describing the problem in terms of 100 year old science. And the problem is, Medical science exploded after 1920. Entire fields of medicine came up. So nowadays we like to talk about gut biome a lot because that's one of the newest things we can study. So everybody suddenly goes, oh, it's got to be gut biome. But that's because they ignored the 60 years of medical science from like 1980 years, 1920 to 2000, that it could also be. So when we talk about different carbohydrates having different metabolic hormonal effects, a technical term for the science of hormones and hormone-related diseases, endocrinology. So different carbohydrates have different metabolic and endocrine effects. You know, that's where, that's 80 years of medical science that's been left out of the empty calories term. And that's where I'm saying many to most of the answers are. Mm -hmm. And I think so just again, it's, you touch upon it as well. Just I think you're answering all of our, our questions in here, Gary. But I just want to so it's the book is obviously a case against sugar. And as you said, a lot of people might say, Why are you not doing it against all carbohydrates? Why are you just focusing in on sugar? So what just kind of what briefly does the difference between sugar have, say, with regards to other carbohydrates on the body in terms of disease and weight gain and obesity? Okay, and to some extent, I don't know. Okay, um, I'm trying to answer this question. So you have different questions that we're all trying to answer. So one question is we have obesity and diabetes epidemics worldwide. Doesn't matter what population you look at, they start eating Western diets. They become obese and diabetic. So clearly, even though they're genetic issues, um, it can't be a genetic thing because it doesn't matter what the underlying genotype is. So that's the question I want to answer. And sugar is the most likely answer to that question. If the question was, now I've got these obese and diabetic populations worldwide, how do I make them healthy? That question has got a different answer. And that question is get rid of the sugar and the refined carbs and maybe the easily digestible starches and replace them with fat. So, you know, again, when you eat, when I'm talking about sugar, you're getting glucose and fructose. And when you're doing it in sugary beverages, you're getting it sort of very quickly consumed and quickly digested. And the glucose stimulates your pancreas to secrete insulin in response. And the fructose is metabolized in the liver and then the context of this insulin secretion from the pancreas, a lot of it's converted into fat. And it looks like it causes insulin resistance. I could be wrong, but there's significant evidence that that's what it does. And then insulin resistance is kind of the fundamental problem in this common form of diabetes and in obesity. Um, when you're just consuming, say, white bread, you're getting mostly glucose, although something I didn't realize is that in white bread in the US, it can be 10 to 12% sugar, sucrose, or high fructose corn syrup, which is what makes it different than like French bread that you might, you know, baguettes that's also white that you might consume in France, which might be only 2%. Um, the glucose, 
you know, is metabolized by every organ in your body. So the more glucose you get and the quicker it's digested, the higher the glycemic index, the greater the insulin response to the blood sugar. But that's a kind of short-term effect, whereas the f effect of fructose and the, the insulin resistance is a longer-term effect that, you know, what I'm arguing makes the glucose, the, the insulin response to the glucose worse chronic. Um, so th those are the sort of basic differences. Um, the fructose metabolized in the liver, the glucose, every cell in the body, um, or most every cell. And one's causing, probably causing insulin resistance and then making the other one worse. So without the sugar, you might be able to consume the white bread without significant harm or the white flour, but because we never see those two separated in populations, it's hard to say. We don't really have natural experiments where, you know, some isolated population only started eating white flour and didn't eat sugar. You do have Southeast Asia where they were eating some flour and rice, but it wasn't you know, the highly refined stuff that we started producing in, you know, the second half of the 19th century with the Industrial Revolution. So you briefly touched on the World Health Organization, and they just, um, I mean, you know, changed their recommendation of our uh, daily intake. Um, they've dropped it from 10% of added sugar to 5% of added sugar. Do you think this, is, uh, this will help? This is good enough? Um, what's your take on that? I mean, it's certainly better. And it'll certainly help. Again, the question is how much people pay attention to recommendations. But it all keeps the conversation going. I think the key thing is, you know, there was a period, right, when the obesity and diabetes epidemic started exploding in the U.S. where we, we had this vague sense that sugar was bad for us. There was a lot of discussion in the 60s and 70s that sugar is bad for us and people are getting fatter and the press is talking about diets all the time. But then high fructose corn syrup comes in and we thought it was kind of healthy. The corn refiners mm -hmm. referred to it as fruit sugar and they made it went out of their way to disassociate it from sugar itself. And all these products appear that have the veneer that are advertised as health foods. The classic one being sort of low fat yogurt with fruit. Mm -hmm. So it's got fruit, which is a good thing, right? Adam and Eve ate fruit. Look where it got them. Wait a minute, I'm getting distracted. Um, fruit is perceived by dietitians as a good thing. We all thought it's a good thing. It's got you know vitamin C and all these good nutrients in it and it's low fat yogurt what could be wrong with it basically take a little bit of the fat out you stick a little bit of fruit in and then you stick in a lot of high fructose corn syrup to replace the mouthfeel and so you take a food that might have started off healthy we don't know that's the fat story and then you've reduced a little bit of the fat a little bit of the calories and you've added high fructose corn syrup, and there are all kinds of foods like this. You know, Gatorade, I mean, who can, Gatorade is like, that's when you're supposed to consume after you exercise, and then Powerade, and all the ones like it, and then the Snapple iced teas that, you know, clearly weren't sodas. They were sort of positioned as, we, everybody kind of knows you're not supposed to be drinking Coke if you're health conscious. So you, instead you drink, you know, Snapple, or the, I, my favorite was Soba iced tea, which was, you know, with ginkgo biloba, okay, so it has this veneer of health, but it's all the calories are from sugar, high fructose mm -hmm. corn syrup. And then you've got things like jamba juices, where I once, you know, contemplated opening a jamba juice uh, franchise in New York, because I was introduced to it in California, and I thought this stuff is the greatest thing in the world. It's basically, you know, pureed fruit. It's a fruit smoothie. And how can that not be good for you? But basically, you're taking, you know, the, all the vitamins and minerals and the fruit and all the healthy stuff, and then you're pureeing it and so that you can now digest the sugar easily and quickly. And there is sugar in the fruit, and there's fructose in the fruit. And so you're creating something that initially was might have been relatively healthy, and you're figuring out a way to get it into your bloodstream as quickly as possible. I mean, you can make the same argument. I know addiction specialists who do, who say, look, clearly chewing on, you know, coca leaves with the cocaine content in the leaf is kind of, it's a mild stimulant, and it allows people, you know, a, a 
natives in the Andes to do remarkable athletic uh, you know, day to day physical activity by chewing on this mild stimulant. And then you slowly um, refine it into a white power that you could powder that you could snort and inject, and it becomes deadly and incredibly mm. addictive. Mm. Um, and on some level, we did the same thing with sugar. It's just it's a longer term process. Um, okay, so I hate the term in moderation, but what is your um, opinion on having sugar in moderation or practicing abstinence? Yes, I hate the term moderation too. It's sort of the flip side of overeating. So people, whenever somebody writes, you know, when the overeating sugar is bad for you, and my response is, well, overeating anything is bad for you, right? That's why you have the term overeating. It's a tautology. You know, the question is, is eating sugar bad for you? And then, again, moderation. How do you define moderation? How do you yeah. know you're eating in moderation? So you, Karen, can be consuming two ice cream cones a day, and you're lean, and you're obviously consuming in moderation. And your next-door neighbor, who happens to be obese or diabetic, can consume one ice cream cone a day, and we would look at her and think that, Clearly, this woman is a glutton and she shouldn't be eating ice cream. So moderation basically means the amount you can consume without being obese or diabetic. So if you're obese or diabetic already, then that would imply that no amount of sugar can be consumed in moderation. I mean, you could consume less, but you can't define moderation in those terms. And the same thing if you're lean. I have a friend who's an emeritus professor of epidemiology at UCLA, and he's about six foot five and 180 pounds and spends his year skiing. So it's, you know, northern hemisphere in winter, southern hemisphere in our summer. Um, whenever we get together, he likes to order three desserts instead of, you know, appetizer, main course dessert, because he can do it. So to him, three desserts are moderation. And I mean, he's joking, and I think he thinks I'm right about the science. But he's making the point that what works for him is not necessarily what works for other people. Um, I recently had this Wall Street Journal op-ed on whether or not sugar is killing us, and I got an email from a uh, fashion photographer in Manhattan who is 61 years old, lives on sugar, plays tennis 200 days a year. He said he has sex with people 20 to 25 years younger than he is. I guess he <laughs> performs well. And he even sent me a photo of what great, and the guy was in great shape. And he thought, if I'm going to write about sugar being nasty, I should always point out that for some people it's clearly beneficial. And I said, so if I'm going to write about cigarettes and lung cancer, am I always required to point out that for 80 to 90% of the people who smoke will not get lung cancer? You know, it's, so yeah, I think, okay, so that's my issue with moderation. I don't think it can be defined. Mm -mm. I don't think it has any meaning in this. It's completely dependent on the individual and on whether or not, I write about sugar being toxic. And um, if it is indeed addictive, then there is no such thing as moderation with somebody who is actually addicted to a substance. And that's the second issue, yeah, because I was a smoker and we've all had our substance issues. Um, you would never tell an ex-smoker, an ex-former an alcoholic or a reformed drug addict that you can do this in moderation. Or that you should even try. I mean, I, I try to imagine the health community saying, well, Gary, you know, you are smoking a pack a day. Why don't you see if you can get down to five a day and just keep it at that? Or even, you know, cut to 15, then 10, then five, then zero. Um, and as an ex-smoker, and I say this in the last chapter of the book, because a lot of my thinking on this, I think in this sense, you know, a lot of nutritionists were too he healthy ever to be a smoker's. Um, journalists, you know, we were traditionally, there was smoking and alcohol for journalism. By the time I got into the field, it was just smoking. It took me 20 Sorry. years to quit, but I could never, you know, it's easier for me to not smoke any cigarettes and to try and mm. smoke in moderation. And I think it's true for me and a lot of people, it's easier not to consume any sugar than to try and do it in moderation. I think it's just that simple. 
If I don't have sugar in the house, if I don't consume it, if I don't, not sitting next to my wife at dinner when she orders dessert, I don't crave it, I don't miss it. And I'm perfectly happy without it. Mm. Um, I think that's true of a lot of people. I'm speculating, but I, you know, I think that's a pretty common phenomenon. And when I talk to people about it, so do they. So for people like us, there's no, the concept of moderation doesn't work. Even if you could define it, you know, a little bit of sugar every day, or I get to have, you know, Friday is going to be my sugar day instead of binging on alcohol. <laughs> or try not to binge on ice cream. Um, mm. You know, it's just easier not to do it at all. Mm -hmm. And um, I think, you know, and again, I, some people can't, they don't want to hear that message, and I don't blame them. I'll tell you another story if you guys have patience. Oh, you definitely do, Gary. We've okay. listened to you all day, so. <laughs> Good. Um, the uh, <laughs> uh, people live catty corner from me. There, there was a famous uh, New Yorker writer and professor at the uh, UC Berkeley School of Journalism, who he passed away about six weeks ago, 95 years old. Um, about a month before he passed away, our, we always have a block party once a year on our street, and his nurse took him to the block party. He was, he had had Alzheimer's for years, so he wasn't that cogent, but uh, he was, you know, in a bathrobe and pajamas was in a wheelchair and kind of curled over like you'd expect for a 95-year-old man. And I was sitting at the block party at a table, and this guy, Bernard, is eating a piece of pie, 95, a month away from his death, and he's perfectly happy. And there's an eight-year-old sitting across from me at the table, who I don't know, who's eating a piece of pie and is perfectly happy. And I'm thinking, like, am I crazy? that I think this is something these people shouldn't do. Clearly, it is such a vehicle of joy and happiness um, that we should be able to have it in our lives to some level, that to advocate that we not consume it is, you know, it's the, I mean, the metaphor I always use, the Grinch trying to steal Christmas. Um, on the other hand, had we never consumed sugar, or had we lived in a culture like, say, France, 50 years ago where, I don't know about the eight-year-old, but we all have been eating cheese plates after dinner. Um, we don't need the sugar. The reason it's so powerful uh, and so saturates our society is because it saturates everywhere. It's like, imagine if we had a drug that just gives us pleasure and didn't have short-term deleterious consequences. That's what sugar seems to have been. So. I think we'd all be healthier without it, but getting to that point where as a society we make that decision, even as individuals we make that decision, is extremely hard to do, and it's extremely hard for me to actually see us getting there, but I still think these arguments have to be heard and made. Mm -hmm. So just to come to that, we've just got a few kind of questions to wrap up um, with it. Where, where do you think we will be in sort of 20, 30 years time? Do you think that sugar will still be as prominent or do you think we will see it as kind of a, a toxic substance? I think it'll, I think we'll have come way down on our sugar consumption. Um, the toxicity argument is a... You know, I don't know how well that'll be accepted. I mean, again, I will see. I mean, uh, a lot of people are going to fight back about it. Um, and I, as I admit in the book, the argument, the, the evidence is ambiguous. So I think, you know, given 20 or 30 years, we'll be eating, you know, 50% the sugar we are now. I think this, the... Like I said, I just think it'll slowly fade away from our diets in many different ways. The problem is if you want to have joy in your diet and pleasure in your diet, if it's not coming from sugar, the other choices are really salt and fat. <laughs> and we demonize fat too, and that's clearly a whole other show. Um, so people are going to have to understand that fat isn't the problem and maybe salt isn't the problem. And so, you know, we could all go back to eating the way the French used to eat or the Swiss back when they 
you know, they were still the longest lived populations in the world. But so cutting back on sugar is one thing, but doing it in a way that doesn't, that replaces it with something that still gives you pleasure is kind of crucial. So we'll see what happens. Mm -hmm. I think it'll be interesting to see where it's, where it goes to. Yes, it will be. Uh, absolutely. So we've got to finish off now, um, not because we want to, but because <laughs> we kind of have to. Um, but what are your top three tips for sugar-free living? Uh, top three tips for sugar-free living. Um, yeah, get... <laughs> I don't like doing this. Um, get foods out of your house that you crave. I mean, again, funny, quick, funny story. I, people sent me from that that uh, low carb LA, low carb San Diego meeting. I met these people who make paleo treats. This woman, and she sent me this box of paleo treats. They were delicious, <laughs> and they're made with honey. Oh, and some no. of them. But some of them have like relatively low levels of honey, so it's like kind of acceptable by my standards if it's, you know, kind of seven grams, you know, per portion, reasonable portion size, I'll, I'll try it. But they were so good that I basically decided on like a week in that I was going to binge eat and finish them all. <laughs> Because I, I was thinking about them all the time. Like every day it was like, oh my God, can I have one now? Can I have one now? I know they're in my refrigerator. I know they're healthy. I really want them. Like I'm up three flights in my office and I'm having this conversation with my refrigerator downstairs. So I just had like three left. I ate them all, got it out of the house and that's it. I'm done. I think these are wonderful treats and I'm giving them a plug, but I couldn't deal with it. So there are a lot of sugared foods in our house that my wonderful wife buys for our children and that I think are relatively benign. Um, but I don't like them, so they don't tempt me. You know, health food, the low-fat health food bar stuff. Um, so I think the key thing is we all know what we really crave, and that's what we have to make sure we don't have in the house um, or in the workspace, which is a problem. Um, you know, if you learn to embrace the fat in your diet, if you can get over this idea that we shouldn't be eating butter and we, sh you know, a full fat dairy and, you know, fatty animal products, um, I acknowledge that they're bad for the animals, but I think they're good for us. My read on the evidence, they're good for us and they certainly make it easier. And you could see this in animal research going back 80 years. You jack up the fat content, you, um, get rid of the carb cravings. So I think if you're, you can replace the cravings with fat. And there's even some products coming out that are targeted at sugar cravings. So there's one coming out in January called Crush Crave or Crave Crush, I always forget. That's very interesting, I've tried it. But the other last piece, I think, again, because I was a smoker, it helps to treat it like you would. If you're really serious about it, treat it like you would any other addiction, which means not only going cold turkey, but setting yourself sort of goals you think you can cope with. So it's like, I'm going to go a week without sugar. And then if you successfully go a week, you could say, now I'm going to go a month. And, it see, and if I really miss it, I could go back to it. But at the end of a month, maybe I'll feel good enough and I'll have made enough progress that I'll keep going. I think three months is probably kind of what you need to have a good feeling for how what your life feels like without sugar and how empty it is of pleasure and how physically you feel. Do you feel better? Do you have so much more energy that, you know, by three months you could clearly say, look, I've given it a, a good experiment and I'm going to stick with it or not for life. But So I think treating it like an addiction and treating it like an experiment. So I'm going to see what happens. I'm not going to commit to a lifetime without sugar because many people can't do that but I'm going to commit to a month or two months or three months and I'm going to see how I feel. And again, this is, you know, I'm an amateur at the addiction stuff. You know, Karen, you're the expert on the science. Um, but I think that's, and again, in my experience, it's a way to get people over the initial hurdles and the, the feeling that this is such a huge thing in my life. How could I possibly live without it? And go, well, we're not telling you to live without it for your whole life. Just live without it for a week or two. And then if, 
if it's not terrible, go another couple and, you know, do it slowly. So that, Amazing. that's... I agree completely. I mean, that one day at a time concept that, that, you know, that comes from the Alcoholics Anonymous literature really, really does work. Um, and it also takes away the, I can never have it again or have to give it up completely. Because saying goodbye to sugar is so much more than just saying goodbye to sugar. It's saying goodbye yeah. to your best friend or a loved one or whatever. You know, it well, has so much what, meaning. You know, especially in the United States, we've kind of, deemed, I mean, life, one of the interesting revelations from doing my book was that, you know, life for most people is very hard and tedious. I mean, until really good TV came along, it was those sorts of daily pleasure. So we needed these addictions. We needed our caffeine for energy and our alcohol and our nicotine and our sugar. Mm -hmm. And it's what made life worth living for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, well, we got rid of cigarettes, that's going to kill us, and alcohol is going to kill us. And, you know, for people who don't have those more significant vices, sugar is what's left, you know? And it's really like it's just what's left. They can't. They're not allowed to eat a lot. They can't. They're not supposed to eat fat. So, you know, it's your, your sugar snack. It's what brings us joy. <laughs> and... You know, I get it. I completely understand it. But I do think that you can get past that point. And you just like, there was a period in my life where I couldn't imagine happiness without mediating it with nicotine. Mm. I mean, I could not imagine not smoking. And then, you know, at like three weeks of awfulness, three months of grouchy, cranky, alienating everyone you know, <laughs> a year of general unhappiness, and then suddenly you get to the point you can't imagine you ever that you ever smoked. <laughs> and you can't imagine going back to smoking. It's sort of like until you get to that point, you never know. I think you could go with sugar. So a year of unhappiness. A to year then of have a lifetime a year of, yeah. I mean it's not, you know, it's not easy, but it's with cigarettes it was easier because clearly I knew it was killing me. Hmm. It, you also just, you know, you smell bad, coughing all the time. It's um and when you mm -hmm. go back, when you smoke, it's not like you get that intense feeling of pleasure you mm -hmm. do from sugar. You just get a sort of, oh, <laughs> that's better. Now I have my nicotine. <laughs> and I think that is, it is because it's so surrounded in our society and it's so accepted. Yeah. You know, and the holidays are coming up and everyone gives sugar. It's, it's that well, that's the of... thing. It's, it's everywhere. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can't. And then, you know, it's funny. If you're trying to quit drinking or smoking, your friends help. If you're trying mm -hmm. to quit sugar, it's like, oh, come on, have some cake. <laughs> <That'd be> crazy. <laughs> <laughs> um, so just just to kind of come back to that, Gary, when is the book coming out? Book comes out. I think it's available on Amazon, December twenty seventh. You can okay. pre-order it. The official pub date might be January first. Okay. And um, it's exciting. A lot of things and is happening. That is that worldwide or is that just America, UK? Uh, America, UK, and about seven or eight other countries that have, uh, it's going to be translated to so far, and uh, probably in Australia available, I would think. Mm -hmm. um, so, Perfect. you know. Yeah, well, we will link. <laughs> We will link to everything there, but it is an amazing read. I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, I didn't know if it'd be, as, be able to measure up as the good calories, bad calories, but it most definitely does. So um, I'm very excited for this one to get out there. So Gary, we are coming up on time. We're very conscious. We could talk to you all day, but um, thank you so, so much for this interview. It's been really probably one of my favorites so far. My know, favorite. Like for, yeah, yes, <laughs> I just like to say you. probably Cara as well. Course. <laughs> um, okay. so thank you so much for being on with us thank you guys this has been great okay <laughs> take care goodbye bye bye Karen <laughs>